I'm honored to introduce our guest speaker, Rohit Ravi, who is from Kerala, India. Rohit is a labor and student organizer and a member of the International Socialist. He has been active in various social movements and campaigns, including the anti-CAA protest, the anti-fascist resistance, the farmers' protest, and is also a writer and speaker, and has contributed to several publications and platforms, such as Socialist Worker, New Socialist, and the Jacobin. Rohit will speak for about 30 minutes, and then we'll have time for discussion. Rohit, welcome, and thank you for being with us today. Rohit. Thank you, Lizzie, and uh, dear uh, comrades and friends, thank you so much for joining today. Uh, I want to start off by saying that uh, every generation has a political question that comes to define their historical moment. And the question of liberation of Palestine is the question of our generation and this historical moment. We are witnessing today the Waterloo of Western imperialism. It's a point at which the hegemony of the NATO alliance has come under massive and international public scrutiny and are losing their hold over the people of the world. Those powers are now charged with genocide, not just in the International Court of Justice, but on the streets by people in our thousands, in our millions. The mask of civility of the Western society has been totally ripped off. Uh, Joe Biden is now genocide Joe. Justin Trudeau is genocide Justin. It is in this context that we are discussing Canada, Palestine, and imperialism. It is a discussion that is born out of our historical moment and the possibility of real change that we can all sense in the air. And this is exactly what is also reflected on the streets when hundreds of thousands of people from all walks of life proclaim in unison free Palestine in our lifetime. In discussing uh, Canada, Palestine and imperialism, it is of great importance to begin today by explaining what exactly do we mean by the uh, word imperialism before we can explain what is Canada's role in imperialism. In our um, everyday language, we often use the word imperialism to um, refer to uh, just a kind of domination uh, of uh, powerful nations or a group of powerful nations over uh, less powerful nation or group of such nations. We also use the term sometimes interchangeably with uh, colonialism, with occupation, with uh, military invasion, and so on. This is all without a question correct. These are all imperialism is certainly a form of domination of less powerful nations by more powerful nations. But we cannot stop our analysis there. It is extremely important to also ask what kind of domination is imperialist domination, what kind of power is imperialist power, and what options exist before us to dismantle that power and to build a world that is free from uh, oppression. In the Marxist view, imperialism is not just an international relations concept or a geopolitical concept. It is also fundamentally an economic concept. And I think that is very important to uh, remember. Imperialism describes a very specific stage in the uh, development of capitalism. The original uh, basis of capitalism is the idea of the free market. But as capitalism develops, when industries compete with each other, and uh, some emerge uh, victorious over the others, and as a result, the others are either driven out of business or uh, are not able to um, are prevented from further expansion. This leads to some businesses growing larger and larger, becoming corporations, until they have a near monopoly over the market. This, in our world, this happens through mergers and acquisitions, uh, through predatory pricing like what Uber does, uh, also with patents and copyright and things like that. But the existence of such monopolies exists in direct contradiction with the uh, idea of the free market because the market is no longer free, even if it ever was, and um, it is controlled. The production is, instead of being dispersed across the market, is uh, concentrated at a very few locations. The story of capitalism or the nature of capitalism is that uh, what starts off as a large number of small businesses ends up being a small number of large businesses. And this is the movement of capitalism towards its monopoly stage. And, but it's not just industries that move in this direction, it's also the banking sector. As banks develop, financial institutions also undergo merging, also through uh, um, merging and acquisition and so on, and a few end up growing large as conglomerates. 
these large banks end up in possession of the capital that is required for the production of the industries. So at this monopoly stage, the industrial capital is now, is now totally dependent on the banks to, uh, to be able to receive capital through credits, through loans, and so on. So, and it doesn't stop there. The large financial institutions also purchase sizable shares in the um, industries, uh, appoint their, the directors of banks are also appointed to the board of director of um, uh, industries and so on. So what's happened, happened at this stage is the merging of uh, industrial capital with bank capital in what we can call finance capital. And in this stage of capitalism, banks are no longer intermediaries whose basic job is to make sure that a payment is made but they have the power upon which all production is dependent. And once the capital is concentrated in these few organizations, once the domestic, domestic market is monopolized, what's next? One of the biggest uh, problems of uh, capitalism as an economic system, and like we won't go so much into detail on this, is that it cannot exist without expanding. It, is, uh, it has to be a dynamic system. So when the domestic market is monopolized, Monopoly capital must seek out avenues, and this means crossing domestic border uh, and finding ways to utilize the natural resources, labor, consumer markets of other countries. And you cannot do this just because you want to. You need to be able to convince or coerce those other countries to be able to do so. This is where the merging of the bank and the finance, a bank and the uh, industrial capital uh, undergoes a further fulfillment, another merging and merging with the state, merging with the interests of the state. This merging of the bank and industry with the state is uh, leads to the state being the political arm of finance capital, which is armed with military power, which is armed with diplomatic power, and um, with the ability to enforce the interests of capital, enable its export and investments to all parts of the world. Domestically, this also creates new avenues uh, for to invest capital. It is also the creation of a domestic war economy, a place to invest, in, invest billions and trillions of dollars each year to create weapons and arms and a, a new market for the sale of those weapons and arms uh, across the world. This is also a cornerstone, as we will see, of Canadian imperialism. Now, with that in the background, let's talk about Canadian imperialism. Even before uh, capitalism in Canada, the seeds of imperialist power were laid with the colonial occupation of Turtle Island and the expansion of British and French empires uh, to North America. The dispossession of indigenous peoples here is a precondition upon which capitalism developed in Canada. Now, I must emphasize that First Nations in Canada are not just occupied territories, they are colonized nations. Uh, with legitimate claims to sovereignty and legitimate claims to self-determination. When we truly understand this fact, we will recognize that all op operations of Canadian capital, all operations of Canadian state on unceded and unsurrendered sovereign indigenous land, such as the Trans Mountain uh, Pipeline expansion, are a part of Canadian uh, imperialism. So in this sense, the history of Canadian imperialism predates NATO and predates Canada's actions overseas. And on the topic of indigenous land defense, I would recommend you to read the article by Brian and Michelle uh, in the International Socialism Journal called uh, Fighting Back on Turtle Island. For many decades, a uh, Canadian state has for long portrayed itself as uh, through the myth of peacekeeping, as a conflict avoidant, peace loving country. Uh, and the architect of Canadian foreign policy for decades, Lester B. B. Uh, B. Pearson, is after all a Nobel Prize winner for peace. But then again, so was Henry Kissinger. So that doesn't go that way. <laughs> but if we begin to dig into the history of Canada, we almost instantly see how this myth is totally hollow. How Canadian imperialism has for long led to devastations both overseas but also here. How, can, how Canadian capital, especially Canadian mining capital, are the driving force between imperialist, uh, are the driving imperialist force behind this devastation. The entire uh, history of Canada, Canadian states' foreign policy, especially in the entire continent of Africa, has been basically an expansion, uh, expression of the interests of Canadian mining companies and banks. But I want to start right off here by talking about NATO and Canada's role in the NATO. 
sometimes people think that uh, Canada is just a background member in the uh, in the NATO. But in reality, when you dig a little further, you realize that NATO was in fact in many ways a Canadian idea in the first place. It was Lester B. Pearson who wrote the first public proposal for a military alliance of the Western powers. This was in the context of growing communist movements in the global south because he believed that the UN Security Council uh, may not be able to enforce Canadian and Western interests globally. He describes the formation of NATO as the most important thing that he participated in. Within three years of uh, creation of NATO, Pearson boasts that his government gave away $324 million to NATO countries. This was the largest donation allowed by the United States. This money was given solely to suppress the anti-colonial resistance um, across the global south, to suppress independence movements in Algeria and in Vietnam, to fund the Dutch colonial powers in Indonesia and West Papua New Guinea, to fund Belgians for the same in Congo, Rwanda, and Burundi, and to the British as well. So this is the role of Canada. This is the story of Canada's central role in the very formation and uh, fortification of NATO. And now I also want to give a few examples of what Canadian imperialism has done in the Global South before focusing on uh, Palestine. We can start with Congo. Canada is perhaps one of the single most responsible countries for the devastation of Congo. Right at the beginning, it was a racist Canadian from Halifax, William Stairs, who led an army of 2,000 people to conquer the resource-rich Katanga region in Congo. In celebration of his violence, Stairs is a monument propped up after him still in Kingston, Ontario at the Royal Military College. Uh, and uh, Canada has officially also passed a parliamentary resolution expressing satisfaction of his quote-unquote manly conduct. Mm -hmm. Since then, the Royal Bank of Canada has financed $40 million World Bank loan to occupy Congo to fund resource extraction in the country. One of the first um, power broker, one of the main power brokers in Congo has been the mining company, the Belgian mining company Union Miniere, which has numerous Canadians on its board of directors from the beginning. Uh, after the Congolese independence, when the Prime Minister Patrice Lumumba uh, threatened to seize control of the resources um, away from the colonial powers, Cong Canada tried every game in the book to undermine Lumumba, and the Western powers, including Canada, uh, secretly funded a secessionist movement in Katanga. And once Lumumba was assassinated, the, uh, the Western powers had no need for this movement, so they brutally suppressed it, massacring people. After this, Canadian mining companies have directly negotiated with um, the Congolese authorities. They have bribed, bought, or otherwise um, paid their way to, uh, to extract uh, gold, cobalt, copper, potash, and so on. As Liberal Canada talks about green capitalism, uh, we should also remember that the lithium and uh, that goes into the uh, electric vehicles, the wind turbines, are all extracted through violence in Congo. Despite this, uh, and another important thing is, 10 Canadian companies have been named by the UN in their report on illegal resource extraction and wealth in Congo as criminal, and Ottawa has done not as, has refused to investigate any of these companies. And the reason why Ottawa has refused to investigate any of these companies is because all across the history, Canadian political class, including uh, the for, former prime ministers of Canada, have sat on sat on the board of these companies as a lobbyist for the Canadian mining companies' interests in uh, in Congo. And like Joe Clark being one of the examples. Mm -hmm. Still, these companies are funded by Canadians through the Toronto Stock Exchange, through pensions, through RRSPs, and so on. Today, Canadian mining firms continue to have billions and billions of dollars invested in Congo in, and in creating divisions among Congolese people, leading to the ethnic conflict and to the ongoing massacres. Canada has the blood of Congo on its hands. We'll also briefly talk about South Africa. All across the apartheid movement, Canada has played the most hypocritical role. Uh, it is like one Canadian foreign policy is one thing on paper, one thing in practice. In uh, it will say that uh, Canada was against the international uh, was in support of the international arms embargo against South Africa. At the same time, it was Canada that helped South Africa gain nuclear power in the same period. 
Canadian mining companies, uh, Falcon Bridge being an example, in uh, what paid direct taxes to the apartheid state of South Africa in return for being able to able to extract resources from Namibia. Like Canadian companies have funded the apartheid state, but if you look on uh, paper, you will see that Canada has opposed apartheid. Canada has done this. Canada has done that. In 1970s, uh, the Montreal Gazette also published an article uh, revealing that uh, RCMP trained South African police on uh, 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 profiling and intelligence gathering of revolutionary uh, leaders. This is the, the same way RCMP did with the ideas. Now, I want to talk also about the Caribbean islands before more focusing directly on Palestine. All across the Caribbean, what we see is that Canadian banks, like the Royal Bank, have controlled and continue to control uh, the financial market. These banks have, have been historically extremely conservative in releasing uh, capital to the local industries. And what this means is that um, they have stunted the development of the regional economies and made them dependent on uh, import, uh, on foreign import. Once this dependency is created, Canadian capital have mon monopolized many aspects of the regional economy. In Belize, it's the Canadian company Fortis from Newfoundland that has a total monopoly over electricity. In uh, much of the cable television network in Bahamas and Jamaica is also run by uh, Canadian capital. Canadian capital controls a huge chunk of even the tourist industry because Canadian, Canadian finance capital has made the regional economies dependent on foreign imports. Uh, even the things that the tourists buy, the food that the tourists eat, are actually imported from North America. Most of the managers' executive positions in the hospitality industry, industry like Holiday Inn, are filled by foreigners, and most of the profit of the tourism industry goes out of the country and out of the region. In the non-English-speaking Caribbean, Haiti is another example of Canadian imperialism, how it has utterly devastated and impoverished the country. Canada, alongside US, destroyed the Haitian, uh, Haitian economy with aid embargo and forced a regime change that took thousands of lives. In 2004, it was the Canadian Special Forces Commandos called JTF2 that seized the airport from which Haiti's democratically elected President John Bertrand Aristide was kidnapped by the US Marines. There are many reasons why Canada participated in this coup and control over Haiti. So, of course, interested in expanding the US sphere of influence and such things. But also, Canadian capital was hostile uh, towards Haiti for one reason. Aristide, in, when he was in power, doubled the minimum wage in Haiti. Mm -hmm. The largest t-shirt maker in the world, black t-shirt maker in the world, is a Montreal-based company called Gildan Activewear, with employing close to 8,000 employees in Haiti. Two days after the coup, Canadian Foreign Affairs stated that some Canadian government companies are now looking to shift production to Haiti. Yeah. In addition to all of the recent reasons, Canadian military intervention in Haiti was also about setting an example to the rest of the world. The year of the coup was also the year Haiti was celebrating 200 years of their freedom, of uh, anniversary of, its, of their historic independence, its celebration of the revolution that spat on the face of Western imperialism, of colonialism, of racism. And although Haiti may have posed no economic, direct economic threat to US and Canada, the imperialist powers wanted to show that they could devastate the country and take over the powers just because they can. Now, with that context, I want to focus on Palestine specifically. It is the biggest example of Canada has, Canada has historically aligned itself uh, with American imperialism from the very beginning, while also having its own imperialist agenda. It was Canada's Under Secretary of the External Affairs who chaired the first committee of Palestine, which established the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine or UNSPA. At this first committee, Nobel Prize winner Lester Pearson rejected the Arab claims for an independent democratic country and insisted that the committee discuss, quote, all questions related to Palestine, which means including the future settlement of uh, European Jews. The UNSCOP then sent a mission to Palestine. The Canadian delegate on this mission was Ivan C. Rand, who trade union comrades will recognize as the Supreme Court Justice who developed the Rand formula, which is the industrial com compromise between trade unions and employers today. Rand was a Zionist. 
and after his mission to palestine he was one of the lead authors of the majority report that supported the partition of palestine into two ethnically uh, separate segregated states so in many ways canadian canadian imperial uh, presence has co-authored the occupation of palestine from 19, 1947 onwards we should also know that a partition agreement signed by us and ussr was informally called the canada plan mm -hmm. after pearson's role in authoring it needless to say in 1957 pearson received the nobel prize shortly after in 1960 pearson received the israel's medallion of valor and in 1968 he received the theodore herzl award named after the founder of zionism from the zionist organization of america for quote his commitment to israel but why did canada and Pearson takes such a personal interest in the partition of Palestine and in the uh, occupation of Palestine by the Israeli state. Was it because Canada considered it important to develop a safe home for Jewish refugees after the Holocaust? The answer is absolutely no. You would be shocked to know, or maybe not shocked, to know that Canada accepted less than five thousand Jewish refugees in the period from nineteen forty three to nineteen forty five. In fact, it is precisely because Canada did not want to accept Jewish refugees that they uh, created the state of Israel and the partition of um, Palestine and the settlement of people there. In this sense, this was Canadian anti-Semitism that was one of the uh, motivators. Another big motivator was that Ottawa, along with Washington, wanted an outpost in the Middle East for Western powers, and they recognized the creation of Israel as the creation of that outpost. This is an old idea dating back as far as Theodore Herzl, the architect of um, Zionism himself, who tried to convince Europe back in the 1890s how useful Israel would be to Western imperialist interests. In the 1970s, the Israeli newspaper Haaretz published a piece in which it basically said that Israel is to be the watchdog of the West to punish any country in the region that goes against Western interests. During the war that was unleashed by the partition and the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians, more than 300 Canadian volunteers were recruited recruited to be a part of the Zionist military force. It is believed that more than more than a thousand Canadians were on the ground over the years to establish Israel. Ottawa did not uh, interfere with any of these recruitments. It looked away, even though they had outlawed the same when Canadian communists volunteered to fight in the Spanish Civil War. So once the creation of the Israeli state was secured by the Western imperialist forces, Western capital, including Canadian capital, became heavily involved in the settlement of occupied Palestine. For example, after the 1967 war, there was a Canada park that was built in West Bank, and this is one of the most disgusting things, where 15 million dollars uh, were sourced from Canadians. to create a national park on land that was once occupied by palestinians for recreational enjoyment of the settlers this is one example another example is the canadian highways infrastructure corporation was a lead organization in a private consortium that uh, spent 3 billion dollars in creating a settler only apartheid highway in july 2008 a west bank village filed a lawsuit a historic lawsuit in montreal supreme court uh, saying that two quebec based companies green park international and green mount international were building um, israeli settlements in west bank on land that was illegally seized after the agreements of 1967 the supreme court of quebec dismissed the claim and asked them to file with the israeli high court instead During the 2008-2009 assault in Gaza, the Harper government publicly supported Israel and was one of the only votes in defense of Israel at the United Nations Human Rights uh, Committee. And uh, in the introduction, Lizzie already mentioned this long history of um, Canada, U.S., and Israel being like a block in all these resolutions. <clears throat> during this, during the 2008-2009, when Venezuela broke out, broke off all diplomatic ties with Israel. Canada took over Israeli diplomacy in Venezuela and became the official representation of Israel in Venezuela. Canada became Israel. Now, finally, no discussion of Canadian imperialism in Palestine can happen without talking about the arms sales between Canada and Israel. 
Since Justin Trudeau came to power in 2015, Canadian companies have exported over 114 million uh, dollar worth of military goods to Israel. Every year since 2015, the amount of arms sold to Israel has only risen. And we don't even know the exact numbers because Canada is able to hide behind the US. The 1956 Defense Production Sharing Agreement between Canada and US makes it possible for Canada to sell arms to the US without regulation or reporting and then US is able to sell this to countries like Israel. There are numerous countries in Canada that are involved in this business of genocide. The biggest company invested in the genocide of Palestinians is perhaps uh, Lockheed Martin, which also operates out of Canada, which leads the consortium that creates the F-35 fighter airplanes that's used to bomb Gaza right now. Since the late 1990s, at least 110 Canadian-based suppliers have been awarded contracts for, the, for this F-35 program in excess of $3.8 billion. Companies like Pratt & Whitney right here in Mississauga make war airplane engines that are sold to Israel. The Liberal government has also lied about Canadian military exports to Israel since October 7. At first it denied any sale. Then it changed its position to say it has only exported non-lethal military goods. But that doesn't mean anything. Non-lethal military goods just means components and parts that are fitted into lethal military goods. Weapons. And used to kill people. The reality is, since October 7th, Canada has authorized $28.5 million worth of military sales to Israel. And this is very important because we may know, we may know also about, if, about the historic case of, that South, uh, South Africa filed in the International Court of Justice naming Israeli genocide. Another important case is also coming up and this directly implicates Canada. Nicaragua has indicated that it will pursue action at the International Court of Justice for naming Canada for its complicity in the genocide against Palestinian people. And this includes the uh, military exports that have been made since October 7. And so for us, here in Canada, it is absolutely crucial to make sure that our movement for Palestinian liberation maintains its focus also on shutting down these uh, companies that produce these weapons and these military parts and an absolute end to the military weapons that um, an absolute end to the sale of military weapons from uh, Canada to, to Israel, whether it be directly or through the US. In conclusion, I want to say that imperialism is about globalizing capital and about globalizing war. And the only way to resist this is by globalizing resistance, and this means to globalize the Intifada. Long live Palestine, long live Gaza, thank you. Thank you so much, Bobby, for that informative and inspiring presentation. Um, you've given us a lot to think about. And so now we have about 35 minutes for a discussion.